I'm going to be asking a few questions of these guys, and, and let's see what they, we come up with here. This is more general information. So my first question to you all was, uh, we're in virtual session for the second year in a row, and um, I'd like to know how has that changed the way you get things done, um, you know, with the way the legislators are influenced by the public. So you can each, you know, have something to say about that. So the House and the Senate have taken different approaches. The Senate, controlled by Republicans, uh, is more open. The House, which is controlled by Democrats, they are scared of their own shadow. So they have a lockdown tight. The, not only is there a fence right now around the Capitol perimeter, so public can't get into the Capitol but to petition your government for experiences. <coughs> you can't get into the state office building, which is where House members have our offices. And if you're on the House floor, you can only, up until recently, you can only have, uh, what was it, 12 members maximum? And so they really limited it. We know the fact, or the truth, that uh, the business of legislating is relationships. And Zoom and virtual distance learning, distance talking, is not a substitute for relationships. Therefore, to answer the question, incredibly inefficient, it's a way of stifling the voices of the people, and the values and priorities of hardworking Minnesotans are absolutely not being heard in committee. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> really, really though. Well. They take away your ability to sit down and have good open discussions, ask the tough questions, see how people are reacting to those questions, to make sure that what they're bringing forward is what is needed. And there are times you got to weed out the BS and call them on it. It's hard to do that in a, over a computer screen because a lot of times when you're speaking, their screen goes black. They may be going and washing laundry. They're not listening to what you're saying. If we're on the House floor, they have to look you in the eye. The people that are trying to pass some of the garbage that has been presented up here are trying to get things by without having to look people in the eye before they before they try to execute their plans. And they wear a mask so that you can they can depersonalize everything for the same reasons. So it is incredible, like, like Eric said, it's very inefficient. Very effective if you want to depersonalize everything, and you don't want to ever have to be called on the carpet for things. So, okay, then and the related question is: What would you say is the best way for us to, you know, all of us, to connect with our legislators um, in this environment, and does it make a difference? Well, I spoke to uh, the chair of public safety committee. He admitted to me this was about a month ago. He admitted to me he had not been to the Capitol in two or so months. So, I, I honestly, I don't know how, in this environment, I'm willing, for my constituents, I'm willing to meet you for a coffee, I'm willing, as I've always done, right? I'm not changing the way I do business. I'm not changing the way that I represent my constituents. Uh, so, you know, Republicans, for the most part, can, uh, you can reach out, but for, for those constituents that are represented by a Democrat legislator, I honestly do not have an answer, I, because they won't even come to the Capitol, let alone, meet with the people they represent. Flood them with emails, phone calls, letters, everything. Keep the pressure on. What you're doing as far as uh, getting on these radio talk shows, doing these interviews, keep your keep your website up, your Facebook page is up, keep doing that stuff because it is it's getting good attention. I think you guys have reached a lot of people in the more the more groups that, the more people that become aware, that you make aware of what's going on, the more pressure that's going to be applied on them. The chair of the Public Safety Committee in uh, the House, when I was discussing House File 229 with him, asked me not to bring it up. Because it could be a stumbling block for some. I, I told him, why would it be a stumbling block? I said, all you have to do is help me move this. Then it would be a stumbling block for nobody. And it would be a win for everybody, especially for the children. 
We're going to make it a millstone. Yeah. Better on that. Uh, why don't you, you can start this time. Tell us a little bit about yesterday's day-long uh, mandatory implicit bias training. <laughs> we have mandatory training. Okay? If we hear mandatory training, we're going to be there. But just to make sure we were there, they said if you're not at that training, you will lose your seats on the committees that you set up. Wow. So they would kick me off of public safety and civil law. That's what they don't want. So if they want mandatory training, if they want people to come to training, and then threaten you if you're not there. And then to make sure you stayed there, they have random attendance taken. Shows a lot of trust, doesn't it? Which it was just absolutely ridiculous. And as you're as you're doing this training, they keep mentioning they keep mentioning the uh, the George, George Floyd uh, incident and the Flannel uh, Gas deal and the Dante Ray. And so I asked them, you know, what about what about uh, what about the uh, 83 other homicides last year in Minneapolis alone? What about the 21 homicides this year already? All from the black community, victims. What, what about them? That doesn't fit their agenda. I'm sorry, folks. Those people don't get a, anybody crying out for them. I brought up Thomas Sowell, brilliant man, who refutes everything that they were putting in front of us yesterday. I have suggested that they listen to some of the interviews that have been done with him watch his biography, and pick up his books. So this entire session, doesn't matter what committee, so I'm on the Public Safety Committee, the Commerce Committee, and the Capital Investment Committee. There are other committees like the Health and Human Services Committee, the Education Committee, the Higher Education Committee, uh, Judiciary Committee, and there's, there's others. Doesn't matter what the committee. Every disparity that exists in Minnesota and across the country, every disparity is there as a result of racism. Whether it's a disparity in housing, right? If minorities have, uh, uh, if they're disproportionately not homeowners, it's because of racism. If there's an education gap, it's because of racism. If there's uh, those that are going to college disproportionately white, it's because of racism. Those are disproportionately in, in prison or the, the criminal justice system, it's because of racism. Everything. And I'm not joking. Transportation. But because minorities are less likely to own vehicles, it's because of racism. If they live closer to a highway, we actually heard this in uh, Capital Investment Committee, and then it was repeated on the House floor, I don't know this. Minorities are more likely to live closer to highways and therefore breathe in the, the toxic. Uh, Fumes because of racism. So that's what was in, in, in this training. And then they took this video, and this was, so I say that as we've been hearing this narrative in committee, and then that leads into the following video that they played. And this is how it's done, not just now, but this is how, you know, have you ever looked at rat poison? You know, rat poison is 99.5% good food, it's 0.5% bad. Right? And so that's what this video we saw and the narrative we've been hearing committee. 99% of it might, or I won't even put that much. <laughs> There's a little, it seems first, a little bit of truth, and then they go on with the rest of them. But in this video we saw, they start with things like redlining. Yeah. Right? Racism did exist in this country, and that's an unfortunate truth, right? But it existed everywhere in the world, and some places it still exists. But what they do is the narrative they do with redlining is they say, okay, here's this truth, this happened, this was a reality. Now we're going to build a narrative on top of that. And they said that because of redlining, there was less property taxes, uh, uh, less property taxes that were collected because homeowners' home values were suppressed. And because there was less tax 
rather than a squat did, the schools were underfunded in minority areas. And because schools are underfunded, there was lower academic achievement, and therefore there was less that went to college, and less that had higher degrees, and less that minorities didn't get the good paying jobs, and therefore couldn't send their children, could, first of all, couldn't buy nicer homes, and then send their children to schools, right? They created this cascade effect was the narrative. I know it's a long-winded question, but this is what they're teaching in the, in the uh, implicit bias. But that video that we saw is what is something that they play in the education system. And it dawned on me when watching that video yesterday, if this is what our young people are learning, there is, we're, there's no, it's, it's no wonder why they're so angry, why they're so depressed. Because this false narrative, it's, it's, there's nothing that they, that this country shouldn't even be around. And so that's the narrative they're pushing. It's so poisonous and dangerous. Uh, and then, by the way, this was the same week. I don't know, did, anybody, did, did, did any of you see the headline? On the House floor, during the education bill, on Monday of this week, that it, I don't think you got any press, but raise your hand if you stopped. So we were having a conversation regarding last in, first out, in terms of teachers, yeah. right? Because of the unions, Last, the last person hired because of union seniority is the first person to be fired for the new that they got for right now. And so that was an amendment, and I was speaking to that. So we had another member who spoke to it, and then I spoke to it, and immediately after me was Representative Hassan. And when she was recognized by the speaker, the first words out of her mouth, the very first words, why is a white man lecturing a black woman? Did anybody hear that? A few hands, see two hands, I see three hands heard that. I'm just curious, how did you hear it? Did, was it on social media? Was it on the news? What? I was listening to every word you said. Oh, you were listening. Okay, you heard it real time. Okay, how about back here? I was watching the screen, and she also said she didn't think the viewer was white, so she just fired me on. Okay, so, <laughs> by the way, I, I, and it's fine, right? It was Sarah. And so, uh, anyway, th so this week, that's what she said, this week, this is the majority party that is teaching tolerance, that we need to respect everybody, that minorities, you know, and everybody has a voice. Everybody should, nobody should be oppressed. This is the part that's preaching it, and this is the poisonous filth that comes out of their mouth. Hypocrisy. Oh, Linda Rundeck is here. Oh, my gosh. Hello, Eric. Hello, Eric. What is your house leadership? How are they training you to respond to that stuff? Are they brewing a, a fighting break? <laughs> you, you know the answer to that one. <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm so regretful. That's good. We can do such a bad job. I mean, Hassan needs to be pounded back on. Push back, right? It is unfortunate that there are too many. Uh, I don't want to look down on anybody because this stuff is hard. It is, you know, people don't want to. I'll tell you what, I, first of all, I don't care if I don't get real life, right, number one. I don't care, number two, if you come and protest in front of my house, I don't care. Number three, I am self-employed. You don't have an employer who can bully me in to try and get me fired, okay? And then, number four, if you end up killing me, Okay, none of these things are going to stop me from speaking. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't mean to look down on anybody who I understand this stuff. They, this, uh, the other side is out there to bully people, take away your livelihood, threaten you, and because of that, many people are intimidated and they're not willing to push back. But there are a handful that are, and uh, you know we just need to push back, and that's that's what I'm going to keep doing. When I first got here to the legislature, coming from a background in law enforcement and the crime and swap team, I asked them, uh, what's it like here? And they said, it, it gets pretty bad here. I said, well, did, 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 did tell me what you do. Well, sometimes they're calling you names. I said, okay. No guns and knives? They told me, no. I said, I think we'll be just fine here. 
So when they come at me with things like that, call me racist, call me whatever, it's like, like I haven't heard this before. I'm going to keep doing what's right. I'm going to keep telling the truth. I'm going to stay in the fight. And I hope everybody else does too. So anyway, my next question, there seems to be a uh, hesitancy for many Republican legislators to address these cultural issues like comprehensive sex ed, obscenity, and school curriculum. They go right um, well, a lot of the times, or most of the time, or all the time, but they don't want to deal with them. They don't want to talk about their parents' rights to control their children's health issues. So my question is, you know, the Democrats are on these cultural issues all the time. And this is where they're running free. Why the hesitancy? Why the hesitancy? That is, I, I do not know the answer to the question other than, uh, I, and I'm sure like, with them. there might be a different answer for each legislator, but I do know that for most of them, it's because they think that they falsely believe. Here's what they believe even though it's not true. They believe that if we as Republicans tackle social issues, we will lose the majority. That's what they believe. And the public is with us. And so they don't want to touch the bathroom bill. They don't want to go after the bullying bill. You know, I had some amendments on the public safety bill that they even told us in caucus before the floor session, well, Eric, we're going to vote against your stuff. Uh, and this was, so they, they had a, uh, so to the public safety bill, they had a language in it that says, a police officer cannot be a member of what was a white supremacy or something like that. Okay, we all agree with that, right? But they're singling out white supremacy by design. So I said, okay, you know what? I agree with that, but let's do a few more. So I created some amendments that say, if you are a Holocaust denier or you support BDS, uh, uh, BDS, what does that stand for? Boycott, uh, divester, and sanction. Right, it's it's a, it's an initiative by the enemies of Israel to try to go after Israel uh, economically. Anyway, I had a member that said, if you believe that, you can't be police officer. I had another member that said, if you if you mingle or interact with or support Hezbollah, ISIS, ISIL, uh, and I had one or two other groups in there, you can't be a police officer. I had another member that said, if you support eco terrorism and animal rights fanaticism, you can't be a police officer. <laughs> Okay, and the last one was, if you support, um, I forget how I worded it, thuggish groups like Antifa and, I uh, forget the other one. Oh, uh, a radical pro-abortion extremist, that's what it was. If you, if you support thuggish groups like Antifa and radical pro-abortion, you can't be continuing. My God, they said, they said, you know, there's some of the stuff we're just not going to support. <laughs> so, I, I, don't, I don't know why. But, I'm, you know, if we want, we need to fight fire with fire. Also, though, we need to have truth and love, right? right? And that's just one of the things that I have to often check myself on. I just, let us go do it. I'm very animated and I'm very blunt. That is not always expected, right? So I have to keep in mind the Lord said truth in love, be truthful, but I don't, I have to keep that second part of my own time because, I'll tell you, in all seriousness, though, I look at it as a quadrant. Truth in love is one quadrant. Another one is truth in anger. Have you seen some people, they're being truthful, but they're being very angry and it turns people off, right? Then you have lies in love. That's the Democrat part, right? That's what they're doing. It's lies in love, and that's why people are receptive to the message. Well, then the last one is lies in hate, right? And then that's obviously not going to be picked up. So I need to keep that in mind. So anyway. I think you're very well covered it. Um, <laughs> I, I won't speak for anybody else of why, why they won't deal with these issues. I don't have the same background. I don't have uh, uh, their constituents. I have a good feel for what my constituents want and what how they expect me to proceed with things. And for District 2A, where I'm from, Pretty much get in the fight, man. We need you to be fighting for to stop a lot of these things or to fight to get these things passed. I would just say that it's it's the cultural issues that drive people's passion. 
and it is the basis of our freedom. And so uh, that the people are with us. The people are with us on these things, and um, and then they are ignored uh, by many, many Republican legislators. And you know they'll give it a nod. You know, say, okay, yeah, right. But it's where the passion is. And I think they're way, way um, you know, misled on that. OK, is there a connection between the uh, lax sentencing guidelines and the child sex trafficking business? You know, I, bet I can't, I, I don't know for sure. I don't know. I don't have I, I don't have evidence myself, but if somebody does, I want to know. From what I'm seeing, nobody's willingness. And like I said, I was working in law enforcement. Injuries ended my career early. This is my new place to serve in the legislature. And from what I've seen so far, I'm not impressed. I am not impressed. We have to start fighting to stop this evil. And I keep telling our caucus that evil is not going to stop coming. It will keep taking and taking and taking until you have nothing left to give. And then it's going to take the rest of that. Amen. We come back periodically and say, we've got a victory. I ask them where. Where's this victory? You gave more away. You allowed them to take more ground from the good side. We've got to start standing our ground, stop evil in its tracks, and start pushing it backwards. Okay, so uh, I just want to point out at this point that there's a DVD back there that we have for sale called Eight Days, and it's a movie put together by Yakov Williams, and I would recommend it because it's a movie, it's not a documentary, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's produced as, as a movie, but what, what it does is it displays, um, it's true stories, I mean, not there's some kind of put together different parts of different real stories, but um, it demonstrates how the sex trafficking industry is embedded into all levels of our society. You have to see how it works, and they give, give this this story, this um, movie, you know, talks about how the schools are, are, are how it's operating in the schools. He says that it's happening in every zip code in America, and you need to know how it works. And this is a, is an interesting, very interesting. It's, 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 it's not graphic, but it's very hard to hear, But and I would recommend that. So, um, so Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the bill to define, of course you kind of said that, the, the bill to define males as, as, um, as in scientific terms. And so why is that, I mean, it, why is that important to have in the, in the bill? <laughs> So as we're seeing uh, in, in committee, I first saw this two years ago on the Higher Education Committee, and, and I'm sure we've all seen it now, whether it be email signatures, or I've seen it on Zooms now, uh, but in committee, it was the, the trifold placard in front of somebody when you're sitting down, uh, your preferred gender pronoun, right? Yeah. And I thought to myself, if that is so fluid, if it doesn't matter, why stop there with sex, though? Seriously. Uh, you know what, I'm in my 40s right now. Why don't I just say, you know what, I identify with a senior and I want my social security benefits now, right? <laughs> or I identify, why well, stop or I identify with whatever race? Or why, you know, why is it gender? Okay, but in this case, we see this gender confusion and gender fluidity. And so, we, whether it be the Equal Rights Amendment, which is no longer sex, it's gender, whether we see the erasing of the distinctions between male and female. I, I said, you know what, as I mentioned before, I believe in science, I'm gonna make this very definitive, and we can't, there's no ambiguity. Right. If you have an XY chromosome, you're a male. And if you're a male, you can't shower next to a female. I mean, it's that simple. Okay, so I thought, I'm gonna make it that clear, and that really separated the 
the man from the Voyagers. Well, <laughs> because there are those then that are arguing with me. You see the Democrats, literally, their argument is you would laugh and cry at the same time. You saw the emails that I received. And that, okay, put all the ones that are total square words aside. There are people out there that genuinely are deceived into thinking you can just claim you are a female if you have an XY chromosome. And they're, they are as sincere as you can be. They have been they're purely deceived. Their mind is warped. And I don't know how to resolve that other than I'm just going to get down to the genes. You can't argue with it. You can't change it. It is what it is. Follow up? Okay, that, no, that's fine. Um, okay, I'll go to the next question. Okay. Actually, this will be... Um, before I ask that, I, I wanted to just mention that we I covered the ERA from uh, this this uh, session, but then in 2019 when they... I, I mentioned that they they called it the Equal Rights Amendment and then made it sound like it was for women and it really was on, on the basis of sex or on the basis of, of gender. And this year, interesting. I mean, we we, had, we, we went after them on that. That is so deceptive. Don't call this an ERA. This is an anti-woman constitution. Totally anti-woman. Don't call it equal rights for women when it's about sex and gender. And they don't call it an ERA anymore. They took that out. You know, one of the things, uh, you did mention sports when the point was still up here. But one of the lines, I wish we could take credit for this. But this, is, I love this line, and it's very blunt, but I love this line. We cannot continue to allow dudes to take home the gold trophies and blue ribbons in women's sports. And that's what's happening. Just the last question. Is there, uh, is there more than House and Senate research staff, the, the political, um, the, you know, uh, yeah, the political research staff, to do to uncover agendas behind nice sounding words like service learning? Implicit bias, equity, social, emotional learning, safe schools, and bodily autonomy. I mean, can't the staff, we do this as, as volunteers. And, and, and why are we the ones that have to come up with this information? Isn't that why this research staff is there? They're paid for this, right? The nonpartisan, the, the nonpartisan research staff. I'm not talking the, about the partisan staff. Well, the partisan staff. You know, I would, I would hope a lot of this stuff gets brought up. As far as from our partisan staff, and a lot of it does in in, uh, in uh, the public safety committee, as far as our briefings and so on, as far as some of the things that they think are hidden. But their job is to make sure that things are done correctly legislatively, as far as the language, as far as making sure that everything is in order for us to have good a good piece of legislation to try to make sure they can't pick it apart. What you guys are doing over here is helping bring more, more to more ammunition to this fight. So they've got they, they've got a job to do, and they try to catch as many things as they can. You also have a job to do out here, which you're doing great, as far as helping bring more of the things that you're finding and seeing to the surface, so that we can so that we can use that ammunition as well in our fight as, as representatives. So, could they do more? Yes, but we all can do more to be to be very well versed and educated on all of our topics. So, what I would add is, I think we're up to twenty six hundred, so two thousand six hundred bills that have been introduced so far. And the way that the, this works is that, so our staff, I think we have a staff member, a partisan staff member for every two committees. Right, so every staff member is on two committees, and what's happening is the way the Democrats work is we have a 24-hour rule, and then we have a six-hour rule for amendments and amendments. Uh, but take a, the the 24-hour rule for amendments, and so while there might be legislation that's introduced and the bill hearing would be announced, what the case? So I guess what I'm trying to say is the Democrat majority they're on the committee such that they wait until the last possible moment to give the bare minimum. Uh, 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 a notice for the committee hearing of what bills are going to be heard, right? And then the deadline for amendments to the legislation is 24 hours. Well, you have a staff member now, there might be a committee hearing with 
three bills that day, each bill being 100 pages, and then each bill, 100 pages long, having three amendments to it, that's nine amendments, and then that same researcher is on two committees. Uh, there's, just, it's, there's just not enough staff power and time to go through 100 pages of junk, and then with 24 hours notice to go through amendments that might be delete all amendments, and understand, uh, amendments might be page in line. So it's not just uh, taking an entire section or paragraph and plunking it in. It could be cross-references to other statutes. It, it can be very difficult and time-consuming to trace where things are going, what exactly is being changed, what's being added, things like that. So quite honestly, it's just, there's just not enough time and the Democrats do this on purpose to, to, to leave the least amount of time possible. Well, that's a good, good answer. Thank you for that. And I have I just a couple comments uh, before, and then we're done with this section of the, of the program. Uh, there, there are a couple of examples of that, which is um, service learning. People don't realize that um, service learning is just training activists, and it sounds like it might be a good thing. It's just training the activists, and they have to do it while they're in school. And that's a big part of what this new civics is. We know conservatives really think civics is a great thing. It teaches us the basics of our constitution, how the whole laws are made, and all these things. A lot of it is service learning. So a lot of bandwagon is going on among the Republicans and Democrats, you know, that hey, let's get more civics in. We're gonna have the kids learn civics. And they're training activists, they're giving money to the to the wrong thing. That's one. Another thing is when the safe in support of schools, Minnesota Schools Act was passed in 2014, which we call the bullying bill. Uh, they call it an anti-bullying bill, but we call it a bullying bill. When that happened, one of the key, one of the of the phrases in there, because all it was was a phrase, was social emotional learning is something that we're going to use. We had no idea what social emotional learning was, and now it's a huge, massive takeover of changing the values and attitudes and beliefs and tracking them with our children is as dangerous as it comes, but doesn't that sound good? We didn't even notice that that was in the bill, much less know what it was. So anyway, that's just a couple of examples. Did you have anything to say? Going back, going back to the, uh, uh, the question about the uh, sex trafficking and such, you know, when I answered, when I answered that, you know, the, I, need, I need the proof to see it, I'm talking about our state government. Yeah. Do I think it's infiltrated and uh, risen up through all levels? Yes. Yes. Concerning the COVID shot, I won't call it a vaccine because it's not a vaccine. It's an experimental gene therapy. So according to the FDA, it was authorized but not approved. And until a drug has been approved, it is against federal law to mandate it anywhere and to anyone. How is that getting by our state? Well, you Repeat have an executive question. branch that Repeat is ignoring the laws. Repeat the question for the online. Uh, essentially, it comes down to, well, I don't want to take over because you guys have an agenda and I see multiple hands went up here, so. Yeah, we're not doing Q&A. I'll just, okay. I'll just answer this. Elections matter. And those that are in power, like the executive branch and the attorney general, if they're choosing to not enforce the law and not uh, or to overlook what's being done, there will be consequences to all of us and they will be held accountable. So elections matter, 